It's, a, it's an incredible honor to be here. I was a student here, and I remind people the year I graduated was after four Final Fours, two national championships, and Duke's first national championship. So well, I at least like to remind Anne of that once I had learned she had went to UNC undergrad. But um, I also came back to Madagascar. I, worked at, I, I was at the Lemur Center doing research and then had this amazing opportunity to go with Pat Wright to Madagascar uh, and another undergrad, um, well, three, there are three altogether, Paul Ferraro, uh, who many of you know for his work on resource economics, and then uh, Michael, who, who is here with us, uh, uh, and the poor guy had to share a tent with me on a hill where I was on the uphill side and we'd end up scrunched together at the bottom. Uh, the, uh, uh, but, but, you know, I came back to actually Madagascar to do my field work, which was on uh, psychological counseling for lemurs and how to make them feel more comfortable, uh, but was actually really focused on extinction and understanding processes of extinction. But this is not what we're going to talk about today. Um, I went from Madagascar because three days after coming back from Madagascar, about a week after coming back from Madagascar, 9-11 happened. And I gave up an opportunity to go to Yale to, um, to serve in the State Department and serve in Iraq. And lo and behold, within this and through this whole series of weird trips on this journey, uh, I still couldn't really get away from Madagascar. So while in Iraq, I found this near beer, three horses beer, which was actually the original image from which THB was created. Uh, in, in Madagascar, which just was weird. So it was almost as it was calling me. That led to moving on to creating the first national park in Afghanistan, uh, and then coming to USAID to create essentially a DARPA for development, which was how do we harness science and technology to improve global health, food security, a whole series of other entities, which Secretary Clinton launched um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I began to think about conservation. And recognizing that 31 years ago, we founded the Society of Conservation Biology, that 30 years ago, we coined in popular uh, commentary the word biodiversity. And in those 30 years, we've had these great successes. We've increased the number of protected areas around the world. And in fact, that increase has been even exponential. Um, but the question, the, the, the question is, how are we really doing? And uh, the fact is, if you look across every major group of species, they're in a state of decline. We're, in fact, in the middle of a sixth mass extinction, the first perhaps brought by a single species, and one that is much faster than the other mass extinctions that we know, and in perhaps that we have probably underestimated those extinction rates. The very species that we know about and have good data on are the very species that have the very characteristics that actually prevent them from being subject to the extinction vortex. They're widely ranging. They live in large numbers. They live across many different places. It is those solitary, narrow-banded living organisms that we are, that are super highly specialized. They're perhaps even more likely to go extinct, but we don't have those numbers. And according to Stuart Pym here on this campus, you know, the idea that the extinction rate currently estimated a thousand times background extinction rates is probably even ten times higher. That we are still in a state of massive relaxation. Um, which brings us to Madagascar, right? The sixth continent, a place of unbelievable biodiversity. And we've seen through genetic work, the number of lemur species from when I left Madagascar in, in, in 2000, 2001, uh, to increase from 45 known species of lemurs to 105 species plus, uh, depending on your, your a joiner or a splitter. Uh, on what you're looking at. And those lemurs, those are really critically endangered. They're CITES-1 endangered species. And they, they are really a flagship for so many other species that you find on that island. We know that whatever, put in your percentage here of what you believe, but a significant portion of the forests are lost. That in fact, all the studies that we are doing in Madagascar, whether you're in a national park or not, you are doing it in a fragment. And we make these assumptions that this is the naturalistic behavior of lemurs when, in fact, we have unbelievably altered that environment in the past. Even when I was doing soil samples, as a result of my work in Madagascar, I would dig down a meter and find carbon layers uh, from when these, what seemed like pristine fragments, were actually uh, burnt before. And we know we're in the middle of this unbelievable reorganization. 
the entire communities are changing, that, that our weather patterns are changing. We heard Meredith speak about this yesterday. We know that there's unbelievable pressure because of traps and hunting. Um, and we know that Madagascar itself has serious challenges with its own human development. 75% in poverty, it's, it's low, uh, 154th out of 188, 11.6% uh, of the roads being paved, uh, big potholes. We, uh, we, we have seen, uh, they didn't have a sign when I approached this one. I, I, was, I remember telling uh, Day Day or whoever was driving at the time, that I think we should slow down. I see something in the road, I'm not sure what it is. Um, these are my red blood cells being blown apart by malaria. Uh, and, and in fact, what we've seen, if you've looked at the Global Burden of Disease study, uh, we've seen actually malaria goes up. And that makes sense with fragmentation because what is surrounding the fragments but rice paddies, flooded rice paddies. We also see similarly schistosomiasis go up and we're seeing a huge increase uh, between 1990 and 2010 in the rate of HIV AIDS. Um, but the other things that are kind of interesting are psychological disorders and anxiety disorders. And, and I, am, I am not a global health expert to really be able to comment on that or a psychologist or psychiatrist to be able to look at that. But, but there, you wonder to what ex extent the pressures on natural resources are having pressures on people or what, what extent the governmental changes have had those pressures. In terms of food security, we know that 50% of the people of children under three years old are suffering from, from stunting, that 50% have some sort of transitional food scarcity. They literally go hungry, they get less calories than they need at certain parts of the year. And this is part of a larger challenge that we have overall. We're going to have 9.6 billion people by 2050, which requires 70% more food. We're having billions of people emerge into middle class that want meat and dairy. And, and the things that it takes to produce those is clearance of an area that is equal to the size of the United States by 2050. That's what we have to clear. That's the Congo Basin and the Amazon. That's Madagascar. And we're actually seeing countries like the Chinese, like Saudi Arabia, export their agricultural production, which puts intense pressures on natural resources around that we have. And I have a challenge. I sat, I was elected to the board of the Society of Conservation Biology, and, and my assessment of conservation is we can be super depressing people to be around, if you guys just saw, right? You do not want me at a dinner party spouting off these facts. It will crash your dinner party as, as you guys have it, right? Because conservation is a, is a group of people that are set up to describe and lament the passing of species, right? We're technophobic, we're pessimistic. I think Prince Charles has probably done more damage to us in some ways. Um, with his stance on GMOs, our failure to address demand and understand behavior change. And I'm really happy that Brian Hare and Dan Ariali are actually working on thinking about, about behavioral economics within and thinking within conservation. We tend to be backwards looking rather than forward looking. We fail to, to really harness the power of markets, although that is starting to change. But I'm hopeful. Believe it or not, I'm an optimist. And I think that much as we have created the problems, we have means to solve them. And this is not to say we replace everything we're doing in conservation, but we have sets of tools that are incredible. The challenges that we have are exponential, but so is the technology that's available to us. We've seen this with computing power. Computing power, the power of chips, have increased in exponentially in, in, in power and decreased exponentially in terms of cost. The same thing is true of storage and memory capacity. Um, the computing power, the internet, is literally parallel processing around the world. We have the ability now to do incredible things with genetics, and we heard, we heard Peter talk about this uh, yesterday. With tools like CRISPR-Cas9, we, we are at an age, as scary as it seems, and this is happening, of programmable biology. You, some of you guys might know Drew Engie and I, iGEMS, right? iGEM was a competition, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Park competition that was among postdocs at Harvard, at Berkeley, uh, at MIT, it is now done by high school students that are creating new living synthesized organisms. You can go to Johns Hopkins and in six weeks create a novel organism in a course as a citizen science. Now that sounds scary, and it is. There needs to be ethical frameworks, but the question is how do we use this for conservation? within what we're trying to do. And there are organisms, uh, organizations that are trying to do so. Move Free has engineered uh, microorganisms to produce milk, chemically indistinguishable from milk, except for the tweaks that they made. 
right? No brucellosis, no lactose, no bad cholesterol, but also no methane. Methane from livestock is a major driver of climate change. No animal cruelty, no clearance of land. These are trade-offs our societies need to make. Um, Pembient, which is another organization I've been working with, is coming up with, with um, uh, bioengineered rhino horn. Their goal is to plummet the market for rhino horns that exist out there, right? Rhino horn is the same thing as your fingers, and they use 3D printing as a source to actually produce it and sell it on medicinal markets. Uh, you know, there is some controversy, right? All these things have a question. Would this actually drive up trade for rhino horns? Not when it's $60,000 a kilogram, and they're selling it for 100. Um, we know that we heard about yesterday the great talks on microbiology and the microbiome. And, and we should think about how we broaden the tent to bring in wildlife probiotics. I'm working with the Smithsonian on how do we address chytrid using a probiotic? How do we actually exist in a post-antibiotic world? How do we get rid of fertilizers within what we're trying to do? How do we bring back the 20% of the earth that is degraded and not currently being used back to productivity? Part of that depends on changing the microbiome, which is literally governed by the rules of ecosystem. I heard all those things of community ecology when people were talking about these communities because that's what we are. And we've seen this democratization of science and technology with the price of sensors because of this incredible increase in consumer electronics, allowing people to create the connected ecosystem, allowing us to put sensors onto everything uh, and understand if you can measure it, you can improve it. And we should be thinking about that. And your cell phone is a sensor, not to mention it's a bank not to mention it's a source of education, not to mention it is a tool for everything else we do. Um, and we've got the ability to use drones and, and, and even nanosatellites. My friends set up this company called Planet Labs. Uh, they all worked at NASA and they thought they had a better idea. NASA spent 20 years to put up Landsat 8, which, which is based on 20-year-old technology because if you spend a couple of billion dollars on a satellite, you test everything that's in it for 20 years. It gives us Three, it gives us 30 meter resolution, 15 pan chromatic every two weeks of the entire planet. These guys said, $40,000, we'll use the same technology that's in your consumer phone, no, not purpose built. We will put up 150 of these nanosatellites, 17K to put them up. They last for a year and a half in orbit, at low Earth orbit. Uh, and, and in that year and a half, every, every year and a half, they put up new satellites that, by the way, are actually better that have faster processors, better cameras, better abilities to network together. And they get three meter resolution of the entire planet every day. And their system gets better as that $2 billion NASA satellite gets older. It's unbelievable. We, we can use these tools in conservation. We've seen amazing advances in data science, machine vision, machine learning. We created tools at USAID, which were cell phone-based microscopes that did automatic detections of malaria and TB. We, we now know that Uber is, has you know, cars driving around in Pittsburgh. Uh, they do have a driver on the front, but they're not, they're not touching the controls because a hole in a loophole in the law. Um, but that all became because of this this research that was out there. And we've got this ability to harness and crowdsource the world for the best possible ideas. There are amazing ideas everywhere, but people tend to be limited by opportunity, not by talent. And the idea is, let's do that. We did this with the Gates Foundation. It was called the Grand Challenges for Development. The first challenge was my favorite. It was saving lives at birth, ensuring all women from the onset of labor to 48 hours after delivery have access to medical care, whether in a hospital or a hut. What you don't hear in that problem statement is a solution, which is what everyone tends to do. I know what the solution is. The fact is, the experts may understand the problems, but they don't have a handle on all the solutions because the world has become multidisciplinary, complex. Technology is, ex is accelerating at exponential rates, which is hard for our minds to get a hold of. What was extraordinary about this, and we did this with Gates, Norway, uh, the UK, and Grand Challenges, Canada, is we had ideas that came from people we never would have expected. They weren't USAID contractors. Odon device came in from an Argentinian car mechanic who saw a party trick about how do you get a cork out of a bottle, which he thought could work for difficult births. It's being scaled up globally by BD, which actually has an office here in the Triangle. 
Duke students in a class at Duke, undergrads, biomedical engineers came up with the Pratt pouch, which solves this problem that if you can get antiretroviral drugs to women just before birth, you can prevent the passage of HIV. Problem is they need a cold chain. So their ketchup packets actually can be stored for a year without for duration. Undergrads at Rice came up with a continuous airway pressure tool that's one-tenth of the cost of those tools that you would have to buy commercially and works better and is designed for the developing world. Cut mortality by one-third and is scaling up through, through, through Malawi. The Pratt Pouch is scaling up through PETFAR. Uh, got voted one of the top 10 most innovative health technologies of 2012 when it came out. These are incredible things. We never would have found them through our traditional mechanisms. New ways of developing TB and malaria drugs by harnessing the world. In fact, the Indians came up with open, open source drug discovery, which brought together 5,700 scientists in 130 countries who worked together to create new IP-free TB and malaria uh, drugs. Um, and 70% of them were from, were from pharma. And we got amazing people, including Scott Laurie, who got his PhD here at Duke with Stuart Pym, who came up with tools for citizen science that allow us to document natural biodiversity around the world. And we can use the crowd to fund things. And this is the number I want you to remember. Last year, crowdfunding people raised $34 billion of crowdfunding. That exceeds the budget of NSF and NIH in terms of their extramural grants, by far. Um, so we got to see conservation change. And it can, we have a model. We have a model from global health. Global health used to be called tropical medicine. It was a single discipline field. It was not very technological, perhaps in its start, outside of the vaccines. Um, but we saw global, so tropical medicine become global health, which meant bringing in engineers and anthropologists and behavioral economists and, and a whole host of other people to help us solve the problem. And so we've got to broaden the tent for conservation within what we're doing. We need to bring in what are called the hackers and the makers and the technologists and the biological engineers and the microbiologists who's in the lab around the corner to help us think about how we solve these problems. And that's why I set up this company, Conservation X Labs, uh, you know, perhaps jeopardizing my entire future but was how do we actually build this ecosystem around these solutions which can be revolutionary, not evolutionary. Let's think about replacements for protein. Let's think about how we restore degraded lands using, using science and technology. Let's think about how do we actually engineer for resilience to deal with the climate lag effects we're gonna see in our oceans due to acidification and warming um, within what we're trying to do. And let's source through prizes, through partnerships with universities, through working with the tech companies, through building our own tools. And we did that. We raised $3 million last year. We're, we've been around for about a year and a half. And we, we raised $3 million to launch a prize on rethinking aquaculture. And aquaculture is this weird thing where 50% of our fish around the world is farmed, but we feed wild fish to farm fish. And that wild fish involves things like slavery and other social problems and environmental degradation galore. So how do we actually come up with new solutions? How do we actually come up with entire new products from the oceans? And we saw solutions such as this, New Wave Foods, which has created synthetic pro, uh, shrimp out of algae, so, so it's so technically from natural substances, but doesn't involve bycatch, doesn't involve slavery, it cooks and tastes like shrimp. Uh, SaberTech, which uses the affluent off of aquaculture farms to actually grow algae that then turns into aquaculture feed. Um, Energ Ener Energea, which is developing spirulina, also off of waste streams, so we have closed loop systems, uh, and making pasta, which I love, right? Which is awesome. Uh, and then some really amazing things. Um, these guys have developed these robotic, this, this is gonna sound a little crazy, but I like it. Uh, they're worried about upwelling stopping and slowing down. Right? And you need upwelling to actually grow kelp to sustain fisheries and all these other things. So they have a tidal powered system that brings up water from depth above the thermocline and then grows uh, farms of kelp. And they're looking at developing systems that are literally robotic, can be out in the open ocean uh, and, and meet food security needs. And um, this is coming out of Woods Hole and the Climate Foundation. And it's just amazing technology. Um, we're also trying to do some things ourselves because we need to. So some of you guys may know lumber liquidators. If you've gotten your really cheap flooring from them, don't. Uh, they, they were caught by the Department of Justice in clearing the Siberian forests, the cedar and oak forests that, that are endangered, but also the last habitats of 
the Amur leopard, world's rarest carnivore, and the Siberian tiger. Uh, part of that money went to a fine. They paid the world's the largest fine in the history of the Lacey Act, thanks to a single Department of Justice Duke-trained J.D. M.E.M., uh, who spent his hours and weekends it, outside of work litigating this case and working on this case. And part of that money is going to this idea of the DNA barcode scanner. We're trying to develop an open source modular using the barcode of life library for traceability, wood trafficking, timber, uh, timber trafficking, and, and uh, animal trafficking. Trees are really hard. Wood is really hard. There's no DNA in wood almost. Uh, but, but this is one of the things um, that we're working on and that we want to give away. Uh, we're trying to develop open, I think, is the future of how we do science. Collaborative platforms to bring different disciplines together, and we're trying to set up one that's essentially an indiegogo for talent and crowdfunding to be able to develop new technologies for what we're trying to do. And then with WWF, we've created Oceans X Labs, which is the first conservation technology accelerator, because quite frankly, conservation has a scale problem, right? It, it doesn't mean anything if all you have is a pilot. In India, a million people is not scale when you have a billion people there. So how do we actually ensure that these ideas through the market or other mechanisms reach as many people as possible? And how do we make that happen? That scale has to be built in at the beginning and setting up institutions that help us get the scale are what we're trying to do. And this brings us back to Madagascar. USAID's about to release a $50 million grant to do conservation in, land, in Madagascar, or contract to do conservation in Madagascar. And we're trying to work with the implementers to get them to think about how do we think of creative new mechanisms to complement the existing mechanisms that we have. Um, I just want to mention one last thing, because I think I've used up my 66 minutes, uh, which is, um, I put together, I spent the last 18 months putting together a course with 25 other lecturers, uh, Indiegogo teaching crowdfunding, um, uh, uh, Stuart Pym talking about extinction, uh, the head of food security for the US government who led global food security efforts talking about food security, uh, Mike Merson talking about global health, some really great people uh, on how do we rethink solutions for it. This is a totally free course on, on Coursera. Uh, please help me spread the word. A lot of these ideas are in them. And with that, thank you guys very much.